Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Wade T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. And today we are getting into biohacking, dopamine fasting, not feasting, which most of us are hooked on, NLP techniques and psychedelics, all topics you know that I love and I know you love them too. And today we have a special guest. His name is Sean McCormick and he is the host of the Optimal Performance Podcast and the founder of the West Coast's highest rated float center change, Float Seattle. Sean is a certified life coach and performance coach working with professional athletes, television actors and organizations like MLS Soccer and Lululemon. Sean is trained in several spiritual modalities and has in the psychedelic, been in the psychedelic space for over 15 years. I think life is kind of a psychedelic space. He's a biohacker, natu natural health enthusiast, and advocate for health freedoms. And boy, oh boy, everybody I know that's in the biohacking and health freedom and like really into this thing is going what the F is going on right now? Because it seems like we are completely under siege in the health community. And yet there is this whole, like what used to be sort of underground, which is kind of emerging mainstream, which is the use of psychedelics, spirituality, NLP, and techniques for rapid transformation. Because if you're not rapidly transforming right now, good luck of surviving or thriving in the next few years. Sean, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. What an intro, man. I, I, I Your energy is so uh, contagious, man. I love it, Wade. I'm so excited for this. Let's do it. Well, you know, Friday. I, was just, I was just listening to um, CC and Daryl uh, Hall, I think, playing on the, like, you know, their, their thing, you know, where it's like the throwback Fridays and I was here dancing here at the, at the bio home. I'm all biohacked up here today, uh, locked and loaded. And despite all the chaos here in Venice Beach, California and the insanity of the public, and that's what, let's just call it what it is. It's insanity, yeah. right? Let's just not go to church. Let's not go to gyms. Let's not let's close down restaurants and health food stores and keep open fast food places, uh, drug outlets, alcohol outlets, and uh, lock everybody up with this continuous broadcast. And if we don't agree with you, we're just going to cancel you off the world. Like, what the health is going on, brother? What are you saying, man? <laughs> We, there, we're, there's this massive opportunity in, in history right now for us as a globe uh, and as a civilization, as humanity, to really emphasize health and wellness. I mean, regardless of what you think is going on, where this virus was created, if you believe in, uh, you know, virology, if you believe that we can catch things, or if you believe in uh, terrain theory, that doesn't matter. What matters is, is that we have this golden opportunity in this time in the world to really f change the narrative, to change the way that we think about our own health. And we are getting an F. The leadership, all of the three-letter organizations that are supposed to be there to support us, to help us, to give us good ideas, to give us solutions, are failing, failing, failing. And it's and it's really sad because for people like you and I and the people listening to this very episode right here, right now, are interested in optimizing ourselves, in being the best that we can be, the healthiest, the sexiest, the most energy, and all of that is under threat right now. I mean, from, from every single angle, just like you said, we can't go, we can't go to the, we can't go to the beach. And I know that's shifted and changed in, in, you know, people have been pulled off beaches and they've, they've made some adjustments, but this notion uh, that, that we are um, unhealthy as a baseline idea that we need to be injected with something in order to, to, to go live our lives. I mean, we are, uh, it's, it doesn't get more dystopian 
than than where we're at. And for me, it's my opinion that that it, it, it emphasizes even more the importance for each of us to take our health into our own hands. We got to get our gut right. We got to get our sleep right. We got to get our relationships right. We've got to move. You know, the acronym of awesome covers all of that stuff. And uh, what is not, there's no V in awesome. There's no Q in awesome. Um, th- there's, it's, it's, it's really stunning to me. And, and, and we, we talked a little bit about this when you were on the optimal performance podcast, um, is the fact that, the, um, this level of, uh, narrative that the people who are advocating for natural health, which is now a bad word, alternative health, holistic health, integrative health now are things that are just being, uh, totally wiped off of the internet. And it's harder and harder to find reliable resources. It's harder and harder to find uh, reliable solutions. And so that's why podcasts like these are so important is to share wisdom, to share information so that people can take their health into their own hands. I mean, I could go all day on on, uh, the bummer that we're looking at, Um, uh, but I want to keep it, I want to keep it optimistic because, uh, this, like you said, this is an opportunity for each of us. This is a waking up moment. And, uh, the data keeps showing, like, if you are, um, metabolically inflexible, you're going to be in some trouble. If you have three or four comorbidities, you're going to be in some trouble. Uh, if you're carrying around a bunch of extra weight, you're going to be in trouble. So what can we do? Well, we can, make sure that we're eating the right things and, and moving around and, and, and optimizing ourselves because uh, a couple of years from now, there I think that there is going to be a major disparity between the people who decided to make some health changes during this wacky time and the people who sat back and ate crappy processed foods and stayed glued to screens and gained the COVID-19 in LBs and are living their life waiting for someone to come help them and save them and make them healthy. And the fact is the government can't make you healthy. They just can't. So um, yeah, I, th- it's, it, this is, there is a revolution. There is a health revolution going on and it's, uh, and it's happening through conversations like this. Really well said. And, you know, I think all of us kind of ride the, um, the information roller coaster where we can get really at some points it becomes so overwhelming and we're in like it feels like we're going into the the mines of moria or something and the and the and the and the, and the balrog is ready to take us out um and then on the other levels it feels like you know we're uh, marching victoriously to a new age of uh, super optimized humans if you will yeah I want to, you touched on something I think that is really important. I mean, the, the research just came in, uh, the average weight gain over COVID, pan, and, and here's the thing, there's COVID, and we're not denying that there's there's this crazy virus out there that's causing very pro- big problems with yeah. certain segments of the population. We're not saying that. But when you look at, well, what are the comorbidities? Obesity, mm. diabetes, heart conditions, uh, you know, lack of exercise, low vitamin D levels, right? <laughs> like, okay, you know, okay, well, let's just, let's just break this thing down. So we have a pandemic, fair enough. Forget all the politicization in the, okay, let's just, how are we dealing this as a, as a, as a human that wants to, you know, give our stack the deck in our favor? Mm-hmm. Well, Taking people out of sunlight, taking them people out of social communications, only, you know, reducing access to fitness centers into health food places um, and an over-reliance on prepackaged foods, I would say, because you're getting it delivered and all this sort of stuff. (laughs) And then bombarding them daily with the latest negative news and keeping them, you know, out of sunlight and out of, you know, love and compassion and empathetic <laughs> situations. I mean, I mean, could you, it, 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 it seems to me that we've, have we just exposed the agencies for what they are? And have we gotten addicted 
to big papa mentality. And that mm. means that, hey, I need to be safe because big papa is going to save me. And anybody who says that big papa isn't going to take care of us is a threat. Would you say that's like, how do people get out of this thinking or do well, they? Well, that, that, that's a really, that's a, that's an important question to ask is how, how can we get out of this? And, um, the, the, so the, the, so the way out of it is, <laughs> uh, the path is the solution. And the path is, is to take your health into your own hands. Uh, it is to not rely on the, uh, my plate, uh, suggestion for for dietary consumption, you know the the um, the governmental suggestion for how to eat, um, right? Crazy, right? I mean, it's, it's it has no basis in any biological sensibility. Nothing. No, no. So it's totally special interest groups which have infiltrated the food pyramid and all this sort of stuff. And it's like now we have you know guys like. Uh, um, Mr. Microsoft, who's now the largest farm owner in the world, and then recently just come out and thought we should dim the sun. Yeah, That's his latest statement. It, it, <laughs> Let's it, dim the sun. This is a solar system. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it seriously, it reads like Bizarro World, um, doesn't it? It, it? Up is down, down is up, in is out, light is dark. It it it, it is the the way through this is through massive action. Yes. And the, in order to get to that place in your life where you're ready to take some massive action to protect your sleep, to make sure that you're reducing your stress levels, to even get into the frame of mind that, okay, I, I can control my own health. I can control the way that I eat, the way that I sleep, how much time I'm getting outside. Th th that is the way through. But even before people get to that, but even before they, that, that, light switches where they say, Hey, this doesn't seem to make sense. This doesn't pass the sniff test anymore. There's all these wacky ideas for what health uh, is according to, um, you know, elected and unelected officials um, like the, uh, like the person mentioned. And for me, it's about the E and awesome. Um, it's, it's about energy. Wait, the E is the E is, is the, is, is education, e in, testing and coaching the, Except well then, for well, maybe we should add add energy uh, to to the end. Maybe that's, that's kind the, of the result. Yeah, right. The we have to have enough energy to make make the move to make some changes. Yes. You know, uh, I, I was I was I was talking with Paul Check a little while ago. Love Paul. He's an amazing guy. Incredible. I mean, just he speaks in quotes. Just the, just coming out from from inside of him, and he said, "Just people don't have the energy." They just don't have the energy to start a garden. They don't have the energy to think really for themselves. You're brilliant, yes. Right, we're, we're, being, we're being constantly bombarded uh, by things that don't make sense. And yet we continue to acquiesce to it. We continue to just to go along with the flow. So for me, uh, energy so that you can actually make some positive changes in your life is everything. And it's my goal and yours as well, I know, is to boost people's ability to generate the energy that they need to make positive changes in their life. If you are, uh, you know, a lot of people are working from home. If you're waking up in the morning and immediately looking at your phone, well, even while you're sleeping, if you're sleeping and your Wi-Fi is on and you have your phone on next to your head and you're sleeping all night with your phone pinging back Wi-Fi all night long, you're behind the eight ball. You're doing yourself a disservice. Um, looking at the environment that we live in, in our homes is an important element to this. So if you're getting crappy sleep, uh, then that carries over into how you feel in the morning. If every single morning you wake up out of bed and you're tired, something's up. You know, if you're relying on four cups of coffee, five cups of coffee a day, just to get through the day, that's a problem. So if you're waking up from a poor night's sleep, and you're looking at your phone first thing in the morning, you're immediately just like dopamine, 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 Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, emails over and over and over every single morning. You're stacking the deck against yourself. You're, uh, you're really making it hard to establish a, a quality morning routine that will stoke your fire, that will get your energy moving. And then 
uh, you know, what do you, what's the first thing that you put in your mouth in the morning? You know, uh, what are you doing to replenish your body to start the day? You know, if you're working from home, uh, is your organ is is the is your is your room organized in a way for you to be successful to be good at your job to manage your work day effectively? You know, a lot of people, you know, you and I have been working from home, um, working from wherever we call home for such a long time that it's second nature to us. But there are so many people that are now working from home who are twenty feet away from the fridge and. 10 feet away from the coffee pot and the television's on back there and they're just totally distracting themselves. So they're being, they're being worn down and uh, their environment isn't set, set up for them to be effective at work. And then um, the activities that they generate from themselves, the, the, the schedule for the day, you know, a lot of people are, are still trying to figure out what to do with their kids. Right. You know, I've, I've got an eight, eight, of, eight yeah, eight and a five-year-old and we're managing kind of every single day. Uh, are they going back? They're going back part-time. Nope. They're coming back now. Okay. We're going to go do a special activities. Okay. What are those activities? And, and if you're constantly behind and you're trying to catch up and you're just waiting, waiting, waiting for that shot instead of planting a garden and, and um, you know, making a fire outside in the backyard and sitting around it at night, you know, wearing blue blocking glasses when the sun goes down to protect your, uh, your circadian rhythm, you know, take, you know, taking really high quality nutrient dense supplements like yours to manage what's going on inside your body. It's really the, for me, the essence of, of, of biohacking is what goes in you, what goes on you and what goes around you. And if you're not constantly aware of those three elements, then how the heck are you going to go garden? How are you going to make smart choices and and plan your life and and take some agency for for what's going on in your life? And sometimes that that has to start with your mentality. You know, if, if, if you're, if you're fearful, it's tough to do really anything else because fear is such a visceral visceral emotion, red root chakra, just stay alive. And most people are just going to that first thing in the morning and sort of staying in that fear space all day long. Now I'm not spiritual bypassing here and saying that it's not hard for people. A lot of people have lost their jobs. A lot of people um, are really up against it right now. And, and, and they're, they're looking for solutions. Well, the solution is you, you know, you have to change yourself. What, what has gotten you where you are is not going to get you where you want to be. And, and, and for me, it's, I I'm on a constant, like obsessive path to figure out all of these different ways that we can boost our energy so that we can make better choices for us and our families and our lifestyle. Great stuff. And um, I think you, you, there's a lot to unpack there. I want to sort of back the proverbial health truck (laughs) back up um, to a couple of things. And because, you know, first off, if if you're one of those people that, you know, lost a job or, you know, lost a business, whatever, Hey, maybe you hated it. Maybe it sucked. So what do you, you know, like maybe that's the thing that, you know, kicked you into a gear and this is an opportunity to reinvent yourself because you got every excuse in the world Maybe you're on a career track that wasn't going where maybe your business was kind of stalled. And, and I always say, Hey, this could be an invitation. Maybe you were killing yourself to, 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 to make the day. And it's a time to pull back to uh, regroup and then, you know, re-engage in a new way in the world. But I would like to know how you were able to have develop and cultivate so much clarity and uh, about routines and awareness and, and how that, and maybe some of our listeners would like to know how, like, how did you figure all this out? And, and what are the most important elements that you integrate in a, I would say a post COVID world or whatever that is, you know, whatever, we're, whatever state that we're in, I don't know what you would call it. Everyone says unprecedented, but I don't know. I don't know if that's actually accurate. I think there's been all sorts of challenges on the world. I think, um, in, and on all levels, whether that's communication challenges or censorship, or whether that is misinformation from special interest groups or government agencies or the actual exposure to pandemics. I think those things have happened throughout history. Oh yeah. 
I think the technological levers of control and information and perspective have maybe never been so tight and influential as they are now. So how did you come up with these things? How did you figure this out? How are you standing there? You know, no lines in your face, big smile. This is some, some blue light blockers and, you know, really shouting out with a bullhorn and saying, hello, wake up. We yeah. can help in control. How did you get there? Yeah. That, that, uh, thank you for asking that. You know, I, I was, was fortunate enough to learn meditation at a really young age. Um, my oh. folks taught 12. Wow. Uh, and I hated it at first. I mean, What's you can imagine, uh, TM. Okay, great. Yeah. So my folks, my folks taught Maharishi, me TM. Maharishi is an amazing guy. Yeah. I, at the time, uh, it was a way for, for my parents to help manage my energy. <laughs> I've, I've always had a lot of it. Um, yeah. And, and uh, if, if not used correctly, you know, uh, sometimes leads to destruction and, and injury and, um, you know, uh, clearly. The curse, the curse of being a biohacker, right? It's like <laughs> you're either going, you know, towards health and, and happiness or you're, you seem to be in, in, in the the gutter of uh, experimentation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, and, and, and for, for type, for type A people that want to go, 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 they have to find something, you know, you gotta, you gotta find CrossFit or, you know, water skiing, whatever, find the thing and throw yourself at it. For me, you know, at 12 years old, uh, I was, a, I was a really busy kid. You know, I, you know, got the ADHD diagnosis, my father was a, a still is a, a behavior analyst. And so he said, you know, we're not going to put you on anything. Uh, we're just going to, we're going to work you out. We're going to, you're going to be, in, you. you're going to run it out of you. And if, when that doesn't work, you're going to sit still. And so I, I learned, you know, my, my father gave me um, his mantra and, uh, and at 12 years old, they, I learned how to sit still, which was the last thing I wanted to do. And what it did, it gave me just a, uh, gave me the, the actual practice was really hard for me. It took me a long, I mean, it took me years and years to really kind of, it, it took me years to have that moment where I was like, oh, I get it now. I understand why this is useful because it gave me just an extra beat in normal life and in, in, in normal states of consciousness to like, not just react, but respond and to be yeah. thoughtful and to be mindful, to be present in the moment. And so th that ability way back at 12 and, and obviously everyone should explore meditation, find the right framework that, that works for you, that resonates with you. There's a thousand options. Most of them come with free trials. TM used to be, you know, 1500 bucks or more to, to go through. Now it's, it's, it's greatly reduced. I don't remember the price now, but I think it's like, I think it's like a hundred bucks now um, to go through it. And that gave me sort of a framework for living in balance, living in balance with my energy, with the way that I was spending my time. It gave me some, say, a, a little bit of a buffer. Now I still went real hard. I still was a, I still was a busy body, you know, and through, through, through college. And uh, it, it was when uh, through my twenties, I was like into my mid twenties and um, I was, worked at a, at a rock station, this rock radio station. And my lifestyle was, you know, pretty typical for 20. You know, it was like, okay, we're drinking five nights a week. You know, we're going to rock shows, we're staying out, we're, you know, and so what I found was that um, I was, I was chub, I was heavy. My skin was terrible. I wasn't sleeping well, and I wasn't fulfilled. I didn't feel like I was in the right place. And I was like, this can't be it. Like, this is not how my, I want my life to go. And that's when I had the, you know, the wherewithal to explore opening a flotation therapy center. I want to stop you right there just for yeah. a second. So what, what was the uh, alarm bell, if mm. you will, that said, this isn't working out? What, what was, was it an internal feeling? Was it an emotional feeling? Was it unhappiness? Was it like, what was it? Well, I, I have the, well, how do I, I mean, I did, did I've been with my wife since we were 15. Um, wow. She's my high school sweetheart. We've wow. stayed together. She's my one and only everything. Uh, she's a very patient person, as you can imagine. And um, so we were, uh, it was, I remember it was like, a, it was a, it was a Friday night 
and I was getting changed, getting ready to go out and she, she doesn't drink. Uh, and, and she's like, again, like, can we just do something else? Can, you know, do, do, do you have to go? Does like, it's going to be the same people having the same conversations. You're going to spend, you know, 150 bucks tonight and you're going to be lousy all weekend. And it was like, uh, and I thought to myself, I can't really argue for binge drinking. Like I can't, I can't really make a great case. <laughs> it works. It works for about the first two years of university. And then the case starts to weaken. Yeah. As, as, as the negative experiences start to compile. <laughs> yeah. They pile up, man. And you see it on your face, you see it in your body and your mentality. And, and I was sort of, you know, spiritually going through a lot too. I was, uh, I was kind of torn between, you know, looking for extended, expanded states of consciousness, elevating my consciousness, and then just like, you know, blacking out, you know, twice a week. So that, that moment was, was followed shortly by um, a conversation that she and I had about like, is this what we want our lives to be? Mm -hmm. And How old were you then? How old were you? we were, we were 20, I was, tw we were 20, 26. Yeah. Uh, yes. The Saturn return here. Is there it was, I was approaching the Saturn return, right? Yeah. Yep, yep. I, I was like, is this what's happening? Uh, I can't imagine that I'm going to be doing this for the next, you know, 40 years of my life. You know, I was making more money than I needed and I was, you know, f finding ways to spend it. And, and, and it was, it wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't going anywhere good. It wasn't going anywhere fun or interesting. And so through this like moment of lifestyle change where it's like, okay, I, I do have to reassess this. I, I don't, I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose myself. It's time to really take a hard look at this. And, and during that same time, we were having conversations about alternative trajectories. We were going to open a juice shop in Hawaii. We were going to go teach English in Thailand. You know, um, we were, we were exploring all of these different, different um, um, ideas for the way that we wanted to live our life. And then I thought back to a couple of years prior when I had my first experience in a flotation therapy tank in a, in a float tank. And that is a whole nother can of worms, my first experience. But I was like, you remember I did that one thing? I floated in that float tank. She's like, yeah. And I said, I've been looking at some of the Google analytics for how many people are actually searching for this service in Seattle. And there should be a float center here. There's one in Portland. There's three in Vancouver. You know, we were in Seattle. And I said, we should open one. And she goes, okay. I love and she, it. She never okay. says, Okay. Better like, than drinking. Yeah. Hey, okay. Anything. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So at that moment, that, that opportunity. A tagline, for, a float tank, better than drinking. Better than drinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> way better, way cooler, way weirder. Yeah. So that, that my, my life made a, a major turn at that moment. And that's when I cleaned a bunch of stuff up. Um, that, sh that was shortly followed by my first experience, um, with ayahuasca, you know, um, started to really enhance the sort of re responsible use of psychedelics to like really change my mind, like really perturb my consciousness in a way that allowed me to move forward in a bold way. So then it was just like, boom, they just started hitting float center, open, have a kid, uh, open another float center, have another kid. Uh, more, more psychedelic training, more spiritual training, just all this stuff just piled on. And here we are. I'm now 38, I think maybe I'm 37. I've kind of lost track. Uh, and, uh, and now I have all these incredible opportunities and I get to have cool conversations. And now I've crafted my life to be able to spend my days having cool conversations with you. And so that, that moment where where you, where you knew that, that something had to change. And, and for, for Layla, uh, my wife at the time that she was really like the catalyst to say, yeah, let's change. Let's really do it. So, I mean, the takeaway there is talk to your partner. Really? I love the fact, yeah. Yeah. I love the fact that she quietly sort of invited mm. an opportunity for reflection on what was going on that allowed you to like, in, which wasn't like, hey, stop doing this. It was like, well, do we kind of know how that movie goes? And I think yeah, in the, in the drinking party game, there comes a point 
where you you get to that space it's like yeah i know how this movie's going to go it's like watching the same film over and over again and maybe it's a good film but eventually it's like yeah and then this is going to happen and you know stinky bob's going to do this and you know maniac mary's going to do that and then that's going to end up and that's going to spiral out of control and we're going to be like blazed out all around and we, we do the you know the the bacon and eggs breakfast the next morning hungover and you know chug a pot of coffee to wake up and you know go visit the family and going oh why am i doing this and then by yeah. friday the next week you're back on it again and you're like it becomes this kind of like remember those cartoons when the background used to just kind of like spin it was the same cartoons that were just like going around yeah. in the background it's kind of like that and we're there again oh it's thursday night friday night here we go again so there's a couple things that i think is cool Okay, so we had meditation earlier. You did the youthful experimentation, and then you decided to get into the float tanks. And could you can you explain what that initial experience for you in float tanks, and then why that you decided that you wanted to uh, go out and open up a, a float tank business? Like like, how did you go from hey I had a cool experience to I'm going to stop partying to yeah I'm going to open up a place and we, we we said the logistics reasons of obviously there was a market there but what was your experience when you started being able to access a float tank regularly and then I guess the next piece so I'm asking a lot of questions at once I'm going to give you a lot of runway here then the emergence of psychedelics in concordance and the yeah. first time I heard about these float tanks was actually um, I was in the bodybuilding world, Frank Zane, uh, who was a former, um, bodybuilding champion, Mr. Olympia from 77 to 79, I believe. And, uh, was the first guy to beat Arnold Schwarzenegger when he landed in 1968 or 1967 or 1968 in Florida. And Arnold was shocked because this guy was so ripped and so asymmetrical and probably today, most people would say Frank Zane would be the most likable or universally likable physique out of the Mr. Olympia mm. eras uh, from 65 all the way on. Beautiful classical lines, kind of an ectomorph, but got really lean and mm. symmetrical and was very, and he had this thing called the insane experience. <laughs> and part of it was in these um, float tanks, right? Yeah. Um, sensory deprivation chambers, they were oftentimes times right. called that. So Let's see where this uh, ship goes. So have at it. Set the coordinate yeah. to the to, to the psychedelic Zamner float zone. Well, it, it it ties together. You know, I based on my meditation experience through high school and college and and post college, I was I kept coming across the connection between mindfulness, uh, the sensation, the experience, and what uh, th the float experience was, which is a, a real disconnection. You could call it that, but a, a loss of connection to your physical body to really change your consciousness in a way where your body goes away and your consciousness, which is infinite begins to expand. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm doing my reading and research into um, mindfulness practices. I came across John Lilly, who was the creator of of right. the float tank, and he pretty was interesting a, guy, John Lilly. Fast, I mean, trip, that guy, fascinating guy. I mean, brilliant scientist and researcher. You know, he was commissioned, uh, worked from the Navy to develop the the, the first uh, flotation tank, and the his idea was well, the the the, the, the uh, earlier than that, they would think that when you were out of extrasensory stimuli. If you didn't have any taste, touch, sound, smell, if your senses were shut off, you would just like fall asleep. And actually the opposite happens. When you are in a uh, reduced sensory environment, your brain goes into theta state and you, you get into a meditation, it sort of meditates you, the float tanks do. So I'm fascinated by this. And I think that in that time in my life, my Saturn was returning. My lifestyle was not what I wanted. I was in this sort of, you know, again, like that sort of revolving door. I, I, I kept, I looked on Craigslist 
to see if there's any float tanks around. And there was a guy uh, that was 10, 15 miles away who had one in his basement. Love so it. I went to Brian's house, uh, who was 15 miles away on my lunch break at my job, where I was wearing a suit and tie, you know, selling advertising at, at, a, at a radio station. And I had an out of body experience in my very first float tank session. Wow. I went downstairs. He got me set up. I got into this, you know, really super cool old school float tank called the Pathfinder. Uh, and that's a great, great super, I mean, like super futuristic, like out of, you know, uh, minority report kind of like just like pod thing. And I, I get in and I relax into it and I begin to go into my sort of meditation practice. And then suddenly I find myself, you know, 10 feet up looking down at myself in the tank. So I could see through the tank. I could see myself. I could see the basement downstairs and through my meditation practice, I, I knew not to freak out. You know, I've had these, these mm -hmm. states of consciousness that are unusual and, and kind of freaky, but you know, I just kept breathing and staying with it. And then I proceeded to like pop out like through his house and into his backyard. So I'm projecting out a body in his basement into his backyard. And I'm like looking at all the details. I hadn't seen his backyard when I drove up to his house but I could see it now and I could see the path where his dog would run around the perimeter of the, of the home. I could see like the play set and all the toys in the backyard from his kids. And then I kind of came back in through the bedroom of his, you know, his son. And then I hear, okay, Sean, your time is up. And I just like pop back into my body. You know, that'll change your life. Having an experience like that, where it's like, I didn't try to make that happen. That just involuntarily happened. And now I find myself like trying to figure out what that was and why that was obviously that opened up Pandora's box for me to dive deeper into it. You know, I get out and he's like, how was that? And I go, uh, I, man, he's like, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's always a great thing when people uh, literally are speechless and, you know, resort to like sounds and uh, the, uh, mm, ah, wow, uh, yeah, that's yeah. great. You're usually on the right track there. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. How am I supposed to be like, well, I had an out-of-body experience and I saw your kid's bedroom and like, you know, so he's like, I'll pour you a cup of tea. So we're chatting and um, pours me a cup of tea and he's like, you know, um, uh, what do you got going the rest of the day? And I was like, well, I'm going back to work now. And he's like, oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would advise, I would advise against that. So I was like, okay. And he said, what, well, you know, you got any plans for tonight? And then I was going to go see a show. I was going to go see, um, uh, 311. Um, so I, I, he's like, it's going to be the best concert you've ever been to because I've had this experience of, uh, of extra sensory, um, um, act, act, well, yeah, it, because I was deprived in the session, everything is heightened on the way out. Yeah. So like colors and tastes and sounds are so much more vivid and that sort of anchored my experience. And it took me a long time to kind of unpack what that was. And I started to dive into the work of Edgar Casey, and I started to look into remote viewing and I started to, to, to do some of these practices so that I could make some, make some sense of what was going on. And then it just sort of stuck with me and over time, as I uh, continued to do this research into these, these altered states of consciousness, uh, I was like, man, I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm going to go back and float at Brian's house, but I have a lot of reading and research to do. And then it was like two or three years later when we had that final, when we had that first conversation with my wife, where we decided to open one. And, and, and that sort of was the, was the foundation for my approach to, to wellness, which is if you've got too much input, if you've got too much food and too much media and too much stress and fear, and uh, you have to kind of simplify, you have to go back to baseline, either through meditation or through fasting or through, um, you know, using a float tank to get back in touch with who you are. You feel like a kid again when you, when you get outside of those external stimuli, you feel you f you're curious, you're more energetic. You know, there's an innocence to that when you're not drinking and smoking and, um, uh, and just being a jackass, you know? Um, so that, that really sort of guided my path 
Then we bootstrapped the business. You know, I saved a bunch of money. We opened this float center, was the first, which was the first float center, the first public center since like 1982. And for, you know, for Frank Zane, I'm sure that a big part of that was recovery. Mm-hmm. You know, like he, not only the magnesium um, um, sulfate absorption to, to release tension um, in the muscles and lubricate the joints and so forth, but to introduce inflammation, but to recover faster. And so that level of recovery, that sort of idea that I need, if I don't want to go forward in my life, if I want to make better choices for myself, I've got to slow down. I've got to shut up. I need to sit still and be calm so that I can make, make better, make, make better decisions. Kind of going back to the way we started this is like, if you're overwhelmed and full of fear you have to start by reducing things before you can add in, you, mm-hmm. you know, this, this idea of this kind of dopamine fast came out of that is what, what variables that can you control so that you can get back to a baseline, you know, it was around that same time, a little bit later, kind of closer to my thirties where, uh, where I first, first did ayahuasca and the preparation for ayahuasca is, is a, is a, is a week or two of no salt, no sex, no drugs and alcohol, no red meat, no garlic, you know, basically like really simplifying your gut and your field so that you can be receptive to the, to the energies of, of this plant medicine. And that really struck with, struck a chord with me because I was already looking for ways to kind of get back in touch with myself. And then things just sort of like continue to, to uh, the universe recognized what I was doing you know, my spirit guides were recognizing what I was doing and opportunity after opportunity came my way to open more businesses, to, to start our family, you know, and then later coaching and podcasting and stuff like that. So, yeah. Super cool. Um, and there's a lot there. I'm going to, I'm going to circle back to the dopamine conversation in a minute. I want to go down, keep going down the psychedelic point and then yeah. we'll maybe some practical, uh, dopamine addiction reduction components because um i think that we're going to have uh, digital treatment centers too because essentially this these devices have created what i would say is probably i i i'm confident that this is potentially the greatest addiction that has ever hit humans Mm. and um it's it's really deep it's really significant and i don't think that we've even come close to identifying how dopamine addictions but just to give people some context texting and driving and response to your texting while you're driving Mm -hmm. is because of an addiction to whatever's coming on that and you are afraid you know going down the road 60, 70 miles an hour or whatever, and you're texting or whatever. People texting actually die more than people drinking and driving now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so to put that in perspective, you know, and I remember when drinking and driving became uncool. I remember that particular time, which started in the, I think in the late seventies, and really hit home in the 80s. And by the 90s, people are like, you know, designated drivers and, you know, get a cat. Like, you know, that became more of the common speak as opposed to, ah, I'm fine. I've only had 32 beers tonight. I'm good, you know. And, uh, and I come from a culture where, you know, drinking and driving was uh, essentially a badge of honor, hmm. very much like how maybe, you know, smoking Marlboros was a badge of honor back in the 50s and 40s and 60s and stuff. And then I think that being on your phone and reachable or super switched on to social media or whatever the latest and greatest is, is also seen as a badge of honor in certain tech circles or to certain business circles. And I think we'll look back on this in 10 or 20 years, hopefully, and see the addiction. But where did... um, ayahuasca play a part what kind of ceremonies it was it like a traditional shamanic stuff was it like santa diamond well like how did you get at that right yeah there's a lot of different you know entrances into that world some and I, I'm, one of my concerns right now is with the information that's out there i think a lot of people are using not going through the pre 
and post, I would say, elements, they're seeing it as, hey, it's the latest thing to do, go hang out with my friends and do some iron. And they're, they're not really treating it as what it is, which is technically a medicine for the sickness within your mind or in your soul that is causing conflict in your life. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a party drug. No. It's, and, and it, and, and you shouldn't do it by yourself. Uh, you're not equipped to handle what you are opening yourself up to. Uh, for, for me, my, my foray into exploration of consciousness, again, sort of anchoring back to my, to my youth with meditation just kind of really started in, in college, you know, experimenting with mushrooms and LSD um, and, and using it in a way to understand myself and understand reality and understand my relationships. And um, when I first was uh, introduced to it, uh, there was a Shipibo. So Shipibo, Kanibo, there's a tribe in, in Peru. Um, and, and if you ask the, the tribe members of Shipibo, they'll say that they were the originators, that they, they found it first, that tobacco told them that they could go find this root over here and this leaf over here and combine them to, to heal. And Which if you look at the odds, dude, I think some mathematicians have calculated the odds of figuring that out. It's virtually impossible that you would put these two kind of toxic substances together and create this other experience. And there's many different versions of how each shaman will, you know, cook it up in the Shipibo people uh, from my understanding. And I have a considerable amount of medical doctors and naturopathic doctors who spend time in the Amazon with them. They also find your particular plant because they're so symbiotic relationship and find the plant that's right for you, which maybe I may not be like, it's a, like right. their integration with ethno uh, botanical influence, you know, like, like if you think of a person that understands the navigation of a city and where the grass restaurants and where the grass clubs are and where you put your food and where you get to entertainment, you can think of that. But imagine a culture for our listeners that have been living for thousands of years, right on integrated on the edge of the Amazon and these traditions and levels of aware, they, they are living in a different world, literally on a day-to-day -day basis. And that world has extraordinary levels of values and information that to the casual uh, urbanite, cannot possibly comprehend it, the, the the rich i mean all of our all of our medicines come from some plant derivative you know aspirin comes from birch trees you know all all of them start as a natural form and the the ayahuasca curandero understands this vast array of plants and dedicates their life to understanding the power of these plants to use them to heal in, in different circumstances. And uh, I, I have not done a dieta yet. I've not, I have not gone into the, gone that, that route yet. And my, my time may be coming, but the opportunity that I had was actually here in Washington state. So through the Shipibo lineage, there were a number of practitioners in Washington who were apprenticing um, in in Peru with the Shipibo people for for you know a decade before they started to come and they would go you know three or four times a year and isolate and and fast and uh, and and diet these these specific plants and so my. Um, my introduction to it was in my first, my first ceremony was, was in the States, um, obviously discreetly and quietly within, within the community of people that I was affiliated with or in, in the community. And the, the first experience for me was beyond anything that I could have expected that I could have calculated for, um, you know, being in a year with, you know, 15 other people and then four shaman and three apprentices inside of this massive space. And there is so much going on. There's so there's, I mean, there's people purging, there's people crying, there's people writhing, 
my eyes are open some of the time and close other of the time. And I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a highly visual um, experiencer. Like my, when I have, even when I, even when I dream, when I microdose or when I'm on psilocybin or ayahuasca, like very, very visual for me. And so, you know, my experience was um, not only were the Icaros, um, how much have you talked about ayahuasca on, on your podcast? Have you gone you into know, it? I haven't, I haven't talked about it that much. We touched the subject a little bit with some people about, so keep going and yeah. let's, 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 let's go as deep as you want to go. So these shaman are doctors, they're healers, you know, they, they have a prescriptive way to heal you and they heal you through, um, uh, these things called Icaros. And these Icaros are songs that represent these plants. It's a technology. It's using the humming and singing and whistling to activate, uh, this plant medicine uh in you and so for example um you know there's a there's a, a plant called um aho sacha and aho sacha is a master plant within within the vastness of the of the amazon there are these different plants used for different purposes and these shaman will will learn that so they'll go for sometimes up to a year or longer eating nothing but a little bit of rice, uh, bony river fish, and then this plant. And they'll rub it on themselves. They'll make tinctures of it. They'll eat it. They'll smoke it. They'll drink it. They'll combine it with the actual ayahuasca plant medicine to learn everything about this plant. And as they learn about this plant, it then becomes an arrow in their quiver it becomes a diagnostic tool, it becomes a treatment for them. So that if you're coming in and, and you have a lot of fear, a lot of bad energy, a lot of um, addiction, um, toxic relationships in your life, they can use, in this case, Aho Sacha as a prescriptive to clean you up. And these Icaros, which everyone's different, every different ayahuasca has different ways to sing these Icaros. You know, they'll say it's in the Shipibo lineage, it's uh, monosyllabic. So it's, you know, um, mean gene buying, mean gene buying, so a so a buying, so a so a buying, being gene buying. And what they're doing is they're, they're, they're curing you. They're, they're, they're healing you through singing these songs that are attached and connected to these plants to help you clear out your field. And for my first experience um, with these 15 other people in this giant yard and these shaman that were singing, uh, I didn't really go in with a great intention, but I, as I, as I started to come into it, it was like, you're here for healing. You're here for healing, for healing, for healing. You're here for healing. And I would ask, well, what, heal what? Heal this. And then they would show me this part of my life that uh, where I made a bad choice, they, they would show me a part of my life where I was, you know, bad to someone. They would show me a part of my past life, um, past lives that I've had before where they, where I, you know, acted poorly or, or had some sort of traumatic event. And that, that healing for me in this first, in this first night went all the way back through a bunch of different lives that I'd had way, 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 way back to really a, a try a, a life that I had in a tribe. Um, and I was, uh, I was a woman. I was married as my husband was there and our kids were there and, uh, he was killed and I was lost in this previous life. And I was this, in this moment, in that night, you know, white dude, you know, from Seattle doing his first ayahuasca experience, it was healing backward. It was healing that part of me from that trauma, from that past life. Shown these incredible flying buttresses and these, um, these amazing um, environments that were blanketed with geometric designs and serpents and alligators where I was immersed with them and connected with this thing. And I was my body was gone. I was, I was not Sean anymore. I was just connected into this place in this place of healing. Um, so to say the least, my first experience totally 
totally changed the way that I saw reality, changed the way that I saw consciousness and reminded me how much or how, how little I really knew about the earth and its properties, where it's from, where humanity's from. Afterward, um, the guy next to me who, uh, who was a, he was kind of a big shot here in Seattle. Uh, I didn't know it at the time. And I was like, you know, Hey, uh, Mike, how was your trip? You know, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I was, you know, kind of enthusiastic and a kid. And he's like, he's like, uh, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, let's do my thing. He's kind of didn't really want to talk to me. And I was like, Hey, I've got to ask, like about halfway through, I found myself in this like arena. Um, and it felt like you were there with me. And he goes, uh, yeah, I was there with you. Did you see this thing? He was, I was describing this arena to me. He's like, did you see the white um, arches? And I was like, yeah, I saw the white arches. He's like, did you see like uh, the lizard guys? And I was like, I saw the lizard guys. I was like, did we really share this experience? And he said, we shared this experience. It happens from time to time. He's like, it's nice to meet you. So we, you know, connected and had a cool moment there. That, that followed by two more nights of that back to back to back, three nights in a row, uh, really really opened me up to a possibility of, of a whole new reality of a whole new frame of consciousness and really sort of anchored this sense of, of wellness that we are so disconnected from in the Western world and disconnected from the plants. We all have medicine in our backyard. You know, we all have these plants growing around us that we can use, that we can tap into, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, saying that to you, of course, you know, that because you, you are exploring these compounds, how to use them, how to help them heal, how, how you can, you know, combine them to help people heal their gut or reduce inflammation or, or increase their focus. Like you're, you're, you're doing that yourself. Um, it was, it was, it was at that point where I really got into natural health and natural wellness um, supplementation and kind of cleaning up and having more, um, more appreciation for, for mother earth. And it's continued to this day, man. It's still a big part of, you know, how I try to live my life. Do you think that your prior training in meditation and maybe some of the float tank training better prepared you for those experiences and did say post your first experience and subsequent experience, do you feel that floating and meditation took on a different tone or a different mm -hmm. capability? Or I'd like to see the inter or in interplay between those mediums. And now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip, rapid cheat meal relief. Research shows that cheat meals can actually be an effective way to boost your metabolism. One key weight loss hormone, leptin, can be increased by up to 30% following a cheat meal. The challenge with the cheat meals is that all those extra calories and lower food quality can be hard to digest, which means you could be totally sidelined with a food coma after big cheat meals. The solution is to take strong digestive enzymes like masszymes, which will help rapidly digest and break down the extra food. Three to five capsules, before or right after your cheat meal can make a huge difference in how you feel following the cheat meal. If it's a cheat day with multiple large meals, you might want to go up to 10 capsules or higher to help you power through all that food. To save 10% on Masszymes, go to masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S.com and enter the code CHEAT10 at checkout. Yeah, for me the ability to not freak freak out yes yeah <laughs> it's huge. yeah yeah because some that, that happens to a lot of people they're not they're not and one of the reasons if you, you know go to a an event like that they'll, they'll test you for you know mental illnesses or compromisations or if you're an ssr our eyes and if you are um maybe on anti-anxiety medication or you have bipolar issues and stuff like like this is not compounds that people need to be playing around with or experimenting with without the guidance and proper uh, 
awareness about com potential complications or psychic breaks or initiating stuff. These are serious compounds meant for that. And I, and I want to caveat that. So, so, so don't go run out to the, to, to your local guy and say, you, you, you know, yeah. Hey, let me, let me gun down a few shots of this stuff and go for a ride. That's, that's a, that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. But going back to going back to this, what what would the changes in your regular quote unquote biohacking or health optimization technologies that you noticed after the experience? Yeah, well, I, I knew I, the the experience going in was I knew to keep breathing, I knew to not wow out and lose it and freak out and just be in total awe so much. It, it, it you really do have to stay present, uh, and if you just like lay back on your mat and just, you know, watch the light show, you're missing the opportunity to do the work. And to, to echo your sentiment, you're playing with portals. You're playing with um, massive, uh, massively powerful uh, compounds that can, if that can open you up to yourself and to entities and to beings and to states of consciousness that if you don't have an experienced practitioner with you to help you navigate that, you, you may be doing yourself some damage. You, you, you may be really opening yourself up to some darkness because it's part of it's part of the it's part of the story too. It's there 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 can't be light without darkness, and 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 there is there is a lot of darkness that we that we try to push away or kind of like ignore, or let go of, and that stuff often comes right up to the surface. And if you don't have somebody to help navigate that or to clean you up or protect you or like refortify you um, during that experience, it's it's a big problem. So, so for me, yeah. Just, just to interject there, one of my favorite lines in the Christian traditions was the light shineth upon the darkness and the darkness comprehend it not. <laughs> and there's similar um, quotations in the Bhagavad Gita and ignorance or darkness is often referred to as avidya or non-knowledge. And there's an interplay between the creationary force, the satanic force, and the separation of light and darkness, and why those are an essential play, Leela, here in um, consciousness or physicality, and, and that which happens in the kind of consciousness realms enters into the light realms, which then manifests into a slower vibratory component, and that's all relative in physics, the understanding of interdimensional and portal realities and stuff. So it might sound very far out, but you can cro find cross um, correlations between advanced theoretical and quantum physics, spiritual awareness, uh, as well as simple breath work and sound practices, which are just methodologies of altering uh, vibratory frequency and matter is a form of slower vibration. If you look at light is both a particle and a wave. And these sort of things start to make a lot more sense mm -hmm. as you dive deeper into this. But that being said, um, you can get lost in one of those realms. And, and, and that's going to correlate to the next thing we're going to talk about. But I want you to continue on in a second. Yeah. The, the the context for for that experience um, really shaped my spiritual practice, mm -hmm. and I've been working for a long time with this incredible woman um, who is a spiritual midwife. She's a she's a channel. She has access. She doesn't do akashic record stuff, but she's a um, she's a channel. So she has access to um, guides, masters. Um, uh, your highest self, her highest self. She works within the pantheon of these uh, these um, um, subtle. Outside, let's just say outside the yellow pages. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and 
And within the context of, of that, of that practice that was, that was strong during that time, what, you know, as I was thinking about which of my spirit guides were present through this experience, I had a, I had a, I wanted to figure out how this stuff kind of worked together, right? How, how does Archangel Michael or Raphael come into this plant work? You know, how does St. Germain um, have anything to do with, um, you know, um, you know, Pinon Blanco, you know, this, this, this plant from the, this plant from the jungle and everything is connected. <laughs> everything is connected and it's an oversimplification, but it's true. There, there are these, there's, there's such depth in biodiversity, as much biodiversity as there is on this planet. And there is a lot, there is much more diversity in the entities the beings, the states of consciousness, the non-physical reality that we just can't pick up on. We just don't, most of us just don't see. And so that marriage of this, this, this medicine work with ayahuasca, I was integrating into my own spiritual practice around working with spirit guides and um, getting, um, real collaboration from these beings that had been with me again, since, since I was a kid and going forward, uh, the, the plant medicines opened me up to a greater appreciation for nutrition, opened me up to a greater appreciation for what we put into our bodies, how we alchemize things inside of our bodies, what, what they do for us. And the fact that each of us are different and we need different things. Um, so th that was a, a piece of the puzzle that's still very, very important to me in the way that I, you know, the, the, the plants that I, that I plant in my garden. And, you know, recently I've been reading a lot into uh, biodynamic farming and um, um, Rudolph, the work of Rudolf Steiner, you know, um, my kids, my kids go to, far out predictions about viruses and pandemic like, like you're going wait a minute yeah how did, and, and i know uh, paul check is you know very tuned into steiner and i would refer people to paul check uh, in some of his summation of steiner's work on his podcast because i think paul has has done a great job of of can um kind of condensing Steiner's work just as a side note. And Paul's certainly a great interpreter of very esoteric things. Yeah. I think Steiner is so far out, but yet so applicable in today's world. Totally. It's frighteningly accurate. Yeah. So uh, anyways, sorry to interject there, but I just thought it was really important because yeah. we'll never have enough time to kind of to dive into the depth of everything that you want to do. We're opening up a lot of doors here. And so I want yeah. to you know, provide some, some avenues and corridors for people to kind of explore if they so wish in, in, in these experiments. So continue on. Sorry to interject. Yeah, no, no, you're right. You're right. Paul, Paul is, um, he is, I mean, he is a living, he is the encyclopedia of, uh, uh or he, he is the he library is of library? Alexandria. Yeah. No, I haven't seen library? it. I've heard about it, but I haven't seen it. Greatest library in the holistic health space I've ever seen by any set. And uh, <sighs> every time I'm down there just to be, I mean, he's, he's got it like the books are immersed in his office. And so like he's surrounded by and in it and actively communes with these these aspects and, and literally is will be in a state and walk to a book. He says some of the books he's never read. He just knew that he had to get it. And then like five years later, he's told that he needs to go and grab that book and read something that's relative to what he's doing. So he's that <laughs> he's developed his intuition to that level, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, so go ahead. Sorry, I keep interjecting. But this is a no. You're totally fine. No, the, the, fine. the the connection with Steiner that I really and, and my my kids are are now going to Waldorf school and you know I'm able to see uh, see how it integrates, see how they teach children, see how uh, the 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 foundation of of 
honoring the soul, uh, honoring the individuality that we have, the opportunity that we have in this incar- in each of our individual incarnations to learn and to and to um, to understand our our how to learn. Also, a big thing that I have really resonated with Steiner on is the connection between uh, the plant kingdom and um, the etheric, the etheric bodies, the the non physical beings, and because my spiritual practice has has revolved so heavily around um, collaboration with my spirit guides and the spirit guides of my clients and connection with masters that that marrying those two with this beautiful blue marble spinning in outer space how these things kind of fit together is something that I will never learn enough about, <laughs> but it, I, it is, it, I am committed to continue to see what they can do, uh, what that sort of worldview, what that, what that spiritual point of view will allow us to continue to, to learn in our lives as we go forward and going again, back to the like first few minutes of this, this podcast, this conversation is about like this opportunity that we have to make some real changes and you have to change yourself. You have to be willing to learn. You have to be curious about, about um, what's going on in the world and, and how your consciousness works. And you should also, you know, you should be careful. You should be aware that, 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 that sometimes things get squirrely and sometimes things get dark and that's okay because that gives you an opportunity to learn, right? I was talking to Paul a couple of days ago in reference to uh, an experiment uh, experience that I had recently that was disconcerting on um, a very deep level and um, talked to him about it. And uh, it was interesting. And one of the things that he said is that if you are truly wishing to engage in a shamanic experience as it is not through hey i'm i'm local industrialized commercialized shamanistic but the true pathways that these individuals embody where they spend lifetime training and learning the methodologies he says anytime that you enter into one of those ceremonies you 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 want to be prepared to to, to not come back to yeah merge yourself with thing and I'm, and i think a lot of people don't consider that like and if you even just use that as a filter the things that you want it to do and the things that you should do on a day-to-day basis so like okay is if this is my last moment in life is this how is this what i want to be doing is this want to be thinking or is this how i want to be and i think by the sacredness of ceremony which has been practiced throughout history and have lost some of its essence in the technological world Ramdas called it set and setting, uh, but setting the set, set, doing the practices, setting the intonations and really getting quiet to go within as opposed to without, to, to become aware of the things that are disrupting our lives or causing us to be less than complete within ourselves and, and total. And I'm delighted that so many people are engaged and now get engaged in this and i'm also concerned that so many people are not bringing the sacred practice of 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 really honoring the divine and the all that is that we don't know and all the the non-linear aspects of existence and non-existence and cautious consciousness and the soul's journey and what really this is all about i think that can be a wonderful discovery but if you're not there your chances of going down a dark alley and having some of these things, I think is much higher and more likely if you don't bring that sacred awareness into something. And, and the popularity of, of centers around the world, um, you know, I've, I've heard so many times from fairly popular destinations to do this type of work that people come back and they are, they are still super open and they've they've um, they've absorbed some energy that ain't so good for them, and they come back way worse off. And maybe they yep. didn't take it seriously, or maybe the environment 
in the community that they chose to go do this deep work is maybe not the best of intentions. And maybe it's not there to help you heal and grow and open and progress in your life, but maybe as a way to, you know, accept your dollars and then see you next time and see you next time. And I'm, I'm, I'm leery of it too. And, and that's coming from a guy who has not been to the jungle. You know, I've not, I've not done seven days in a, in the rainforest, you know, I've, I've, uh, or a beach, you know, I've done it, I've done it here locally, but it is something that I think that, um, that people should be, should take very seriously, should take very seriously in their preparation should take very seriously in their reintegration after their experience. And I'm, I'm having conversations with, with a couple of different centers and a couple of individuals that are involved with different centers and as to see if I can help contribute with some integration stuff. Cause that's part of the work that I do is to help people. Okay, cool. You learned some cool stuff. You saw some great stuff. Now, what are you going to do with it? Right. Well, that's the, that's the other part is post. And a lot of people I think sometimes make, um, radical and not well thought out decisions afterwards that cause a lot of distress and like they maybe get into or get out of relationships uh, that have severe consequences there may be career shifts that yeah. have are not well thought out beforehand and and so grounding this in a daily practice with uh, i would say post guidance as much as pre-preparation, I think really can make psychedelics a great tool. And without them, I think they're better left not tried unless you're willing to do both the pre and post work. I totally agree. And, and if, uh, unless you, and, and we need help, right? We, yeah, you need guidance in these things. This is either not. Talk to reach out to people who've done it before, reach out to people who you respect. And you're like, man, I really like the way that this person handles this. Well, and how, who they are as a person. Yeah. That's a good sign. It's like, are, are they freaking out at their, their family members? Are they yelling? And they like, like, who is that person? And, and chances are, if they haven't cultivated those capabilities themselves, they know someone that has, that is guiding them through this. That is, you know, the idea is when you go to these experiences, is that you come out with a directional awareness of the things that you need to work on in your regular life and maybe initiating or, or engaging or deepening a practice that allows you to become a more integrated, happier, healthier human, not one that's like totally off the, the Looney Tune train and, and you know crashing and burning in this idea of pseudo-spirituality new ageisms where you get lost and and your life goes downhill and your family members are going what happened to that you know to bob or to mary <laughs> you know we all have those we know people like that right yeah the, the 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 work up to and the work on the backside of of experiences like this is is everything because your friends are still there at home, your family, your habits, all of the things that you, when you left to go do this experience as, as, as seeking, seeking greater awareness, seeking greater clarity, seeking some healing, you all the same vices, all the same habits and negative thought power patterns and trigger points are all there waiting for you in return. So unless you have somebody that you can work with to help navigate that, or unless you have enough resolve in yourself to say, okay, I'm going to make some behavioral changes. Like I'm going to give up sugar. Like I'm just not going to touch it. I didn't touch it for a week before ceremony. I'm really, I'm really not going to touch it anymore. I'm not going to, um, I'm, I'm going to choose not to watch so much media. I'm going to choose to be more kind and think about how I respond to my children. I'm going to, um, I'm going to, you know, consume less plastic, like those sorts of changes, uh, like, that's just as like a, at a baseline. Um, you can also start meditating. You, you can also start journaling and, and continuing to build off of that experience. Like what good is a spiritual awakening if you don't do anything with it, right? If you just, you know? It just becomes an experience, not a, a, a course correct or a, a course direction. 
And I think that's, and, and then what happens is a lot of people start chasing the next experience. Yeah. And then you're, you're just like that guy going out on the bar on Friday night. Yeah. You're chasing it and you know the scene, but you're not taking away or extracting the wisdom out of life. And you can, you can extract wisdom out of the mundane or the sublime. It's, it's yeah. the, the extraction of wisdom is, is a cultivated process. And one of the qualities I think that denotes masters is most of them live a relatively simple life. And there's a great line in the autobiography of a yogi, which I find is a, just such a great text. Yeah. Where Yogananda says that the contemporaries of a master are not limited to the narrow present. And I think there's internal wisdom <laughs> throughout the ages uh, in regards to that. So I think we've covered that one, but before we wind this thing up, because we're going long and I love it, it's very <laughs> fun and we're having a great time. I want to get into something practical that maybe our listener can listen to, that they can take it, yeah. take it for that. And we talked about fasting. We talk about getting quiet or being able to move the distractions. And we also talked about uh, digital addictions. And, and I think now that we've kind of gone through all of that, you know, psychedelic component in its information. I think the first step though, before engaging in that is like, Hey, let's face it. You and everyone else is addicted <laughs> to, to, to this. I think it's pretty concordant and there's various levels. And some of those addictions are manageable, I guess, to a certain extent. And a lot of them aren't. How does, and maybe you can explain the mechanism of the addiction of technology and then how you've come to doing these kind of dopamine fasts or dopamine resets, which is starting to catch a little bit of trend here in the um, biohacking community. Yeah. Yeah. It's about dopamine. We are constantly. Oh, oh, oh. That should be a book title. It's about it's dopamine. Oh, dopamine. It's about dopamine. Yes. It is. Where we have found ourselves now, where we just, it's part of our life that we are glued to our phones. We look at it when we're waiting in line at the grocery store, pumping gas, driving at 70 miles an hour. We're doing it to just escape for a minute. And that is doing terrible things for your attention span. It's doing terrible things for you, the neurotransmitters in your brain. And we are frying the mainframe kind of all day, every day. And if you are waking up with your phone and you're on tech all day, and then the last thing you do is watch two hours of Netflix and you're looking at your phone in your bed before you go to sleep. And then you click off your phone and you're like, okay, I'm gonna go to sleep now. Um, you're, you're doing, you're selling yourself short and there are a couple of different ways. In fact, it's funny because I, I've, I've had frameworks that I've worked on clients with, uh, with, with, I have this thing called the full moon reset and to be totally honest, and, and I've really talked about it like this, Wade, but I've built out courses before on this and, um, I have, for some reason, I just have not. I have not like activated them. They're built, they're done, they're ready. I've got two that I really like that are really effective, but something it's, it's like, I've got this full moon reset. That's about like detaching from, from dopamine and all these negative habits that you have. And, 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 and I, I feel bad, like marketing it <laughs> because, right, right. you know, it's like, uh, I have this other thing called the stop method and I'll cover both of these. Cause these are really, really useful, but like I, I deactivated the Kartra account and the link on my website doesn't work anymore because it's like, I, I, in order for me to get through to people to do this stuff, I have to market it and I have to think about marketing and I have to look at the screen more. Maybe Jordan, you can Jordan <laughs> Dr. Jordan Peterson talks about this. He says, do not underestimate the importance of marketing. If you want to get your message of, uh, your, your most important message and, and, and free is not always the right price. Right. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a, it's a quandary. I'm, I keep finding myself well, in. I'm curious about this because uh, a lot of people don't know this. I don't think I've ever revealed this, but um, 
years ago, I did a full moon uh, ceremony in Bali, Indonesia at uh, the Tirtha Temple, which is the water temple, which is outside of Ubud and um which is a really great place in bali and you go in there and and they've had this temple i think since the 1200s or something mm. it's like it's, it's really is seven eight hundred years old it's really old temple and there's this water that comes down and it goes through these different things and they there's a ceremony and you get in the water under the full moon in the jungle and it's a purification aspect and you go all right well i'm doing it. and i got there and you know it's like white guy standing in his special towel in the water and they're all you know the balinese are kind of like oh yeah we got another one of these guys you know kind of doing the thing and you know i get to the points and these wonderful balinese people looked at me realized i didn't know what i'm doing and like hey you know dip yourself under this pipe this pipe this pipe this pipe but those last two those are only for people that have had deaths or people that are having births. So you don't go to those ones, just do these ones here. So they guided me through it just like serendipitously. And I went through it, was transformative. I I mean, I had a, after the event, which was interesting as it was, but after the event, I had a transformative experience relative to an aspect of my, emotional life that mm. had been unresolved at that moment. I was going through a difficult emotional piece and it really worked. And I was like, this is like guys seven and eight years ago, figured out this full moon thing in the jungle. Like, like, yeah. They got this stuff like, yeah, there's something to this stuff, right? Yeah. So, so dopamine, which is the primary neurochemical, which is associated with addictions in cocaine and heroin and, speed and all these sort of things. And and it's also oftentimes the referred to as the neurochemical for performance and, and yeah. uh, acceleration and excellence and type A personalities. And, you know, you get the dopamine hit and, um, and it's addictive in its nature. Right. Yeah. But in, 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 it's designed to increase neurogenesis so that you create increased axion and dendrites to a behavior mechanism that develops the neurophysiological connections to the performance of a particular skill or task that may be supportive to you as a human. That's the cultivation, is a summation of what dopamine is designed to do. So for example, if you are a caveman throwing a spear and you practice this a lot, you develop these axon dendrite connections by repeat it. And when you hit the bullseye, you get a hit of dopamine, Mm -hmm. which further anchors the thing and you throw it again. And you, so this is the whole mechanism of practice or overexposure for the achievement or development of particular skills, whether that's physiological skills, cognitive skills, it's that aha moment. It's that yes moment. It's the winning moment. It's the one we all cheer about when the crowd explodes for the touchdown. This is the dopamine response mechanism, which has been used throughout humanity forever to cultivate excellence in everything. Yet some guys in Silicon Valley and some great, you know, neurocognitive uh, PhD said, Hey, how can we create devices that will leverage a host of technological interventions to give us the dopamine hit so that I stay on this app longer and we can sell you more stuff. Yeah. That's really a very crude, rude summation of what's went what gone wrong. And now we have people literally, I watch it in Venice here all the time on their phone, walking out into traffic, oncoming traffic, while they're like, thumbing with whatever like they're responding to some s- social media post or twitter account that they they blew up with the latest political guy and they're out there texting him you know smack the car hit them and it's like oh, God. can you like you know addiction to me the definition of it is is a compulsive behavior that is leading to a, a negative outcome in both your personal professional life yeah we want to define that right yeah. or emotional disease psychological disease or in its extreme case where you are impaired 
your decision-making process to an extent that you are taking on unnecessary risk for yourself and others with uh, dire consequences. That, that was how I would call addiction in a summation kind of point. But this, the thing is about leveraging, you know, the dopamine addiction stuff here, the problem with it is you, you're, you're not getting the positive, like you're not yeah. getting a positive development of the skill. So you, you literally abuse the chemical in your body, not what it's for, but for someone else's gain. And that's yeah. a big problem. That is a big, you're right. That That's so well said. That is an excellent distillation of what's going on and getting a little hit, you know, uh, a like, you know, somebody double taps a post that you did, um, a response on Twitter, an email, you know, try some like it's just the, it's constantly firing. We're getting it watching TV. We're getting it um, watching the news. We're 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 constantly seeking it out, and it's on demand. And the colors are designed to 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 fire that. The you know, there's so much money and so much research. Genius people f- leveraging that neurotransmitter and that, that effect. And you're right. It's not making you better. There's no improvement happening there. You know, you, even for folks like you and I, who use social media to tell stories and to help people and to sell products that we believe in, they're changing people's lives. Those we're using it and it still gets squirrely pretty quick. You know, it's like this, when you are finding yourself at every opportunity, just like going to your phone, stop yourself. Just I'll, I'll give a specific example yeah. so people can understand. So I, I, I moved down to LA last year and then I had to get my driver's license, uh, my California driver's license. I got in a, I got a, and it was, it's a total ridiculous task under COVID situations. I bet. I want to give a real world of how dopamine addictions mess me up. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a social media guy. I have my team that handles that. And they, they walk me through the steps of how to do an IG live. I still, I did one today. I was like struggling to get on there. It's hilarious. And you know, all my young adept people on the team, they're like, Oh yeah, it's, 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 it's the old way we need to explain. They send me the message of what I need to do to interact. But, and, 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 and I tend to use YouTube, for learning, like I want to learn something or get insight from different perspectives. And it's great. But in related to this, to explain how crazy this is and how it can impair your life. So I got my my beginner's drivers. I'm, I'm supposed to get my other drivers. I haven't got to the point of where I need to go again. And, I, and now it's expired. And I got to get another one. And so I still use my Canadian license and, I, and, and I've been renting cars and I've been searching online for cars, right? Like, like okay, and, you know, then I, like one day I'm sure I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna buy the BMW X5. And then the next thing, no, no, no I, I, it's California. I want a convertible and should I get this convertible? And then I, and then, oh, wow, well, you know, I don't know if I wanna buy this money for that. Maybe I could get one of these old retro cars and how, Oh, it could be the apocalypse. Maybe I should get a Humvee. And then I'm looking at these, <laughs> like, I'm on, and now I'm in some like government site that's selling old military Humvees. And the next day I'm on luxury auto looking at like, you know, used Bentleys. And then the other day I'm like, no, I should just get a, like a Ford Expeditions guy, throw lots of bucks and stuff in it. Or like, but, and then I had this, this is the other night I'm sitting at home. It's 1139 at night. And what am I doing? I'm scrolling through Facebook Marketplace. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at cars. And then it dawns on me, I've been looking at cars on Facebook Marketplace for 14 months and haven't bought a car because I'm addicted to the possibility or what I could get from the car. Right. But actually having, and whatever the car I get, it's a car, it's got four wheels. Okay, maybe you look cool and the guy goes, oh, wow, nice wheels are like, oh, that's a bucket of bolts, whatever. Yeah. But 
living in this dopamine anticipation cycle has yeah. actually become more addictive than actually having the car itself. And then I realized, well, wait a minute, I've gone 14 months without actually owning a car. I just go, when I need a car, I just go rent a car and go down a lot and I get another dopamine hit because I'm like, oh, I'm gonna take the Mustang convertible today. No, oh, I'm gonna take the Audi, you know. So I've driven like, <laughs> Over the last year, I've driven like 50 different cars. <laughs> oh, <laughs> an experiment. So it's totally gotten out of control. 1139. You're going to reveal something for me to get out of this, this yeah. car, drug addicted dopamine hell that I've been living in. That yeah. I've just come to the realization uh, a couple of Saturday nights ago that I'm locked into. Yeah. So it's called the full moon reset. And it takes a half sidereal cycle from the new moon to the full moon. And in that 14, 15, or 16 days, you're going to quit Facebook. You're going to use only technology that is essential to your work. If you have to work, right? If the you likely use a computer for work, go ahead and use it for that. No, no social media, I'm no Netflix, no YouTube, like, literally no media for 14 days no During, media for 14 days is no, you can nothing. make it yeah you can make it two weeks you can make it two weeks two and weeks would be bad two weeks. so it's a media fast yep. you're gonna just take a break from it if you yep. want to if you want the the support and kudos that you're doing something cool for yourself you can tell your friends you know you can share it you can post it online say hey i'm doing the doing a you can call it what you want you can call it full moon reset uh whatever um taking 14 or 15 sometimes 16 days in this half day sidereal cycle leveraging the power of of moon phases do you start on the full moon or do you end you, you, you start on the new moon which is no moon. new moon right so no moon in the sky and you can look it up on a on a moon phase calendar Love you start it. on that day uh, it's the darkest night of the moon okay. cycle so there's no moon in the sky that's when you start for those 14 days, you're going to media fast. Okay. You're also going to radically change the way that you're eating, right? For a lot of, you know, especially, you know, for you, Wade, you're dialed for a lot of other people who have, you know, a bowl of ice cream or a glass of wine kind of at night, cut it out. Like no gluten, no flour, no sugar, no alcohol. So that, so you're, totally changing like in 14 days changing the way that you consume food mm -hmm. and drugs and alcohol right it's abstinence it is it is a fast from it so you're going to fast from media you're going to fast from foods that are very good for you processed garbage you know you, you've covered that at, at you, over and over on on your podcast and in your appearances you're also going to fast from negative thoughts about yourself in this half sidereal cycle, you're going to keep a little journal and you're going to take notes. You're going to take a, make a check mark every time you say, oh, I need to fill in the blank. I should fill in the blank. Every time you say, I ought to, I need to, I should make a note of it. Every, just make a little check mark. Every time that you say, you dumb, dumb, what are you doing? Why'd you do that? Make it, make a note of it. Like, quote unquote, you know, uh, knock it off dummy, you know, this negative self-talk, uh, totally change the way that you talk to yourself and then habits. So there's four pieces to this. The, the fourth is habit. Do you, are you sitting too much? Are you not exercising enough? Do you smoke? Uh, do you bite your fingernails? Do you rage for no reason at your neighbors? Do you snap at coworkers or staff members? In this period, you're going to totally fast from media, from bad food, from bad thoughts, and from negative habits. Keep track of it. Make a note. And in, so the next question is, well, what do I do instead? Well, you do the things that really you enjoy. You play cards with your friends. You play guitar. You read books. You meditate. You go for walks. You do everything else that our ancestors and their ancestors before them did, which is to reconnect, to simplify. You will find 
the first three days are, are a nightmare. They suck. It's hard. It's could be the sugar, you know, could be the caffeine that you're not, you're not on. It could be the media. You're going to, you're going to be jonesing for sure. Three days in the, around the fourth day, typically it gets easier for people. They're like, Oh, well, I'm actually feel like I'm sleeping really good. Holy crap. I got the best night's sleep that I've had in 10 years. Day four, day six, day seven, you begin to feel more creative. Maybe I want to write a poem. Maybe I want to um, play music. Maybe I want to, you know, go stack rocks in my backyard, go, you know, whatever. Keep with it, keep with it, keep close track of your habits in this in this half sidereal cycle. And then at the full moon, that's when it ends. At the full moon, on the night of the full moon, you're going to make some decisions, some agreements with yourself to decide what you will choose to put back in. With conscious choice and awareness, what am I going to consciously go back to? Am I going to go back to Netflix or am I going to, am I going to, um, quit my subscription? Am I going to choose to have a glass of wine on the next day after the full moon or not? Am I going to have a cookie or not? Am I going to rage at my employees or bite my fingernails or not? Am I going to go back to these negative thoughts that I have or not? What you will find is when you give yourself, this was kind of based on this sort of diet prior to the ayahuasca ceremony, you're going to feel, you're going to feel like a kid again. You're going to feel youthful and creative and happy go lucky once you get through that for that through that first uh that first phase of it you will all of these little markers that you are giving to yourself all these dopamine hits that you're so used to just like activating all day long into the nighttime are going to make way for a lot more quiet a lot more stillness a lot more spacing out you're going to be outside more you're going to be having more fun and then then from that day forward, and this happened with so many of my coaching clients, it's like they let go of a ton of stuff that they know is not serving them. But instead of like, oh, my coach, you know, my life coach told me to quit doing this stuff. It's like, no, this isn't me. You are making this conscious choice to, to go back to this stuff if, if, you, if, if you do. And, it's, and you get to pay the consequences. If you're going to go back to glasses of wine or raging, then it's a choice. And you know that it's a choice. And that is a huge distinction between trying, uh, you know, a a, a cleanse or something. And I like cleanses. Cleanses are awesome. But when you are making this conscious choice and you're leveraging the power of the moon, you know, you probably know more about the moon than I do, Wade. You know, there, there is this, there is this massive, uh, energetic awareness that our ancestors, you could hunt when the moonlight, um, you could stay up later. You could see better at night. It was more active, you know, that full, that, uh, that full moon ceremony that you did with the water. Like there's a reason for that, why it's done because the energies are higher because, you know, there's the gravitational pull and, and the moon is, is an important, you know, uh, archetype for us. So I don't know. Do you, yeah, wh- how does that strike you? Does that sound? Love it. I, yeah. I think, right. I think it's something that I think people, it's worthwhile experimenting because here's the thing, all that media that comes in, it's not going away. No, you can go away from it from a little bit. I want to ask a couple quick questions of it before we wrap up, just, just in regards to that. So because I, I can hear what people are going to say. Well, Sean, Wade, you know, hey, guys, um, I need to interact uh, on Zoom or I need to interact on media as part of my job or part of my performance. How do I navigate that if I'm doing a fast? So is it just I can put the output that I need, but not being the input? Or how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, it, all non-essential media use, you just let go of, you just stop. Right. If you need to be on a Zoom call for work, be on a Zoom call for work. If you if you can help it and plan ahead a little bit to reduce some of those engagements for that two week period, it's going to help immensely. Right. What about music? What about music? Uh, how, yeah. How, how you do That's, it? Like so? So because because music can be extremely stimulating. So. Uh, that's a good question. A lot of people ask that. Um, I, I say no, um, because you're going to a screen, you have to go to Spotify or Pandora, you know, um, 
if you've got compact discs or if you've got pre-done playlists, it's a slippery slope because um, you turn into that world and now you're hooked, right? You're hooked, man. They got you. Uh, I, I would make music instead for just for two weeks. You know, everybody's got some instrument laying in their room or house. And if you don't go get one, go get a jaw harp or a harmonica and, 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 and commit to it because it is stimulating. It is, it is dopamine enhancing. And what you're doing is trying to, as much as you possibly can in this modern paradigm, like reduce that. So no, I, a lot of people ask that question. What about music? And I just say, just stay away from it. Play music. Awesome. Yeah. Any other um, caveats or integrations around the, the dopamine full moon fast? You know, there, there is, there is, there is something that's sort of adjacent to that. Um, this neuro-linguistic programming technique, and I'll kind of go through it really quickly, but I, it's, it's such a powerful technique. Um, this kind of goes, does go into like the mentality um, aspect of it. Um, and I'll go through, I'll, I'll breeze through it. I invite everybody, to, anybody that, that wants to learn more, just reach out to me and I can, I can show you how to do it. This is called the stop method. And the stop method is a classic neuro-linguistic programming technique that uses a pattern interrupt to rewire your brain away from a, from a non-productive emotional state to a productive emotional state. And it works in four parts. And I'm going to, I'm, like I said, I'm going to breeze through this, but it's, 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 I've seen it work for so many people. So um, quick one minute story on how this works. So I had a client who was using this stop method and he was going through divorce. Uh, he was divorced. His wife cheated on him and um, there was a custody battle for the two boys. And every time he saw her, he would be enraged. He was so frustrated with her. She cheated on him. She's being the custody thing got nasty. So uh, he's like, Sean, I got to do, so I'm just, I'm so angry at her. I, when I see her, I just get so frustrated. It's affecting all of my life. It's affecting my relationship with my kids. And I don't want to talk bad about their mother. Um, it's really bad news. So we went through this stop method technique together. It takes a couple of weeks to do. Uh, in fact, you could integrate it in with this during the, the full moon reset. And, um, when he was, he wanted to replace the anger that he had with her with something else. He wanted to get past that emotion. So he went through this process. And after two weeks, he had a classic interaction with her. He was picking up the kids. She was, you know, giving the kids to him for the weekend. And she, she's like, you're five minutes late. What's your deal? Like, what's your problem? Why are you so late? Come on, get a life. And he's like, I'm sorry. I was stuck behind a truck. You know, I'm, um, I'm just going to, I'm going to have a great weekend. You know, I won't be late next time. You know, sorry about it. And she's like, uh, why are you being so weird? And he's like, I'm not being weird. I'm working on not being angry. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a lot of time and attention to just not be angry. Now I'm choosing not to be angry here with you. And she said like, well, are you stoned? Are you high right now? you're high, aren't you? Are you smoking dope when you're picking up the kids? And he's like, no, no, that's not it. I'm not high. I'm just, I'm, I've changed the way that I'm dealing with you. I hope that you can understand that. She's like, I'm going to call your mom. I'm going to call your mom and I'm going to tell her that you're smoking weed before you're picking up the kids. And he's like, you don't need to do that. I'm not high. It's all good. Like just, I hope you have a great weekend. And then after those that typical, you know, she poked and prodded three or four times to try to trigger him because that was their dynamic post divorce with this custody stuff. She's like, well, what, what is it that you're doing? And he's like, I'm, it's called the stop method. You know, my life coach is working with me on it. And she's like, well, like you're being weird, but I'm, I shouldn't have come at you that hard. I shouldn't have gotten in your face and been such a jerk to you. I, I apologize. And he was like, he, she, he, he's, so he calls me, he gets home, he calls me. He's like, dude, you will not believe the interaction that I just had. I was so, I, I, I couldn't even feel the anger for her. I was not, I was so not angry with her that she didn't know what to do. She freaked out. And so I had to explain to her what I was doing. So here's how the method works. So there's four parts to it. The first part is you're going to actually go to that emotion that you don't want to feel. You're going to go there. So in this case, 
For Adam, it was anger. He was angry. So he would get into that place of anger. He would be sitting in a chair. You go to that place. And once you're there and you know, when you're there, you don't have to go, you have to mire in it or stew in it. But once you know that you're angry, say, okay, I'm angry up. Oh, there it is. Okay. Now I feel it. You're going to stand up out of your chair and you're going to say, stop out loud. Once you say stop, then you're going to replace that negative emotion of anger with something else you've, you've worked on ahead of time to replace that anger with, in his case, it was uh, gratitude. It was gratitude for his kids. That was his anchor. His anchor was gratitude for his children. Once you've replaced anger with gratitude, then you're going to do something physical to signal to your central nervous system. Oh, we like this. So for him, it was like he was doing it. He would do a dab. You obviously you want to do this privately. <laughs> so he would like do the thing and then he would dab because he just was like the celebration moment for him. You do it over and over and over. You do, you do three sets of 10 reps um, every day for two weeks. And what it does is it overrides this emotion. And what happens for most people after a couple of days, you, it's hard to even feel the anger because you've done this so many times, you signal to your central nervous system that you don't want to be angry because it's not serving you. The anger that he was having for his wife wasn't helping his situation. So instead he wanted to feel grateful. And so he had done that enough times that when he was faced with this moment where he was totally triggered and she was poking him and poking him, he just like, I didn't, I, I wasn't there. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have that urge to be angry. So people, clients of mine, have combined this stop method during the same time where you have the moment of clarity and you're not overstimulated and dopamine crazed to practice this stuff. I've seen it people who are going through lawsuits. I've seen it people who have gone through the death of a loved one. I've seen it with people who, um, uh, Oh, around food, people who have like, you know, this like craving that I have around food that's, that's around them. So I wanted to at least like throw that out there because it's such a useful tool. I, we, I sped through it, but it's, it's really effective. And I invite anybody that's, that's curious about it just to reach out to me and I can explain it more. Again, I have, it's part of a course, but I don't have the, I gotta, you know, right. <laughs> a lot of things, a lot of open loops there. A lot of things. Sean, where can people uh, reach you, find out more about your podcast, maybe come check out uh, your float tanks? Uh, yeah. Things cool and uh, optimal. Yeah. The, uh, the podcast is Optimal Performance Podcast, and you'll find it everywhere. Um, we're on YouTube too. Um, and you can go to my coaching website, which is seanmccormick.com, S-E-A-N-M-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K, seanmccormick.com. And then it's real Sean McCormick on Instagram. That's where I'm the, the, the platform that I'm most active on. And yeah, I, I just want to say thank you, Wade, for, for creating a container to have such important conversations. I'm a huge fan of your podcast. I'm a huge fan of the products. Leaky Gut Guardian is working for me, my man. I It is working for me big time. Um, the mass zymes, I, everybody that I talk to in, in health and wellness um, gushes over mass zymes. The, the, the products and the, and the things that you're doing in the world are so cool and so important right now. I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you and, and that I honor all of the, all of the important work and, and uh, yeah. So thank you for being you. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me as you know, we're on a mission to end physical suffering and activate what we call biologically optimized health. So there you have it folks from psychedelics, uh, dopamine resets, the full moon, and floating your way to the next level of your optimal self. I want to thank our guest, Sean McCormick, for joining us today in his busy schedule. And for all us listeners out there in digital world, before you hit that detox component, give us a little dopamine hit, send us a like, smash the like button, put up some hate if you need to, that works too. Whatever your feedback is, we appreciate it. We thank you for listening and we hope that this has been valuable for you. Uh, and to your help, why not do one of these experiments? Try a float tank, maybe find yourself a good shaman, 
uh, do a dopamine reset or take time to think about what you might be able to do under these crazy circumstances that we're living in and find the wisdom and direction that will lead you to your best self. I'm Wei T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers. This is the Awesome Health Podcast. Thanks so much for joining. God bless. And now for a Bioptimizers fixed digestion tip. Turn cultured foods into superfoods. Raw fermented foods like sauerkraut and low sugar, live yogurt can be good for you, but rarely have enough of the right probiotic strains for therapeutic benefit. So here's a way that you can turn them into superfoods. What I do is I get some raw sauerkraut or a healthy yogurt. Ideally, you know, it's grass-fed or coconut-based, and you can empty three caps of P3OM into a container and mix it up thoroughly. Leave it at room temperature for a couple of hours before putting it back into the fridge. And what's going to happen is these probiotic levels will be multiplied. In fact, it doubles every 20 minutes. And then what you're going to get is you're going to have a food with strong proteolytic activity. To learn more about P3OM and why its patented strains make it the strongest probiotic available, go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizers Awesome Health Podcast. You can find more information at bioptimizers.com.